he's now playing with spaces of higher dimensions, so I'm going to stick to two dimensions because that's the only thing I can draw, right? But you have to imagine that this could be a four-dimensional space, a fifth-dimensional space. And then he started going, well, you know, I wonder if the space has more structure. So he started following trajectories. So he didn't start a trajectory there. Now, this is not a pendulum anymore. Let's forget about the pendulum. Let's assume that it's about something else. He started following trajectories. He knew that kind of snake around a little bit. This is the history of the system, a series of states that the process is following. But he began to notice that they would tend to converge at particular points. And he said, what the hell? You know, now I'm going to start it in a completely different place. It was a very different trajectory, but it converged at that particular point. So he thought, wow, wow this is some, I have something here. This is interesting. He started the system again. The system did some snaking, but ended up at the same point. He started it again. Almost as if the trajectories, which represent the history of the system, the series of states that the system followed as it was changing, all seem to be attracted to a particular point of phase space. And he called that point an attract. Sorry, what exactly did he do? What type? Well, now, now instead of taking a pendulum, which was a real machine, he just started taking equations. You know, which were models of systems. Random equations. Well, not necessarily random, but equations that had been used in physics. You know, they, if you want, if you want to know the exact equation, I'll tell you what the exact equation is. Let me see. No, I want to mean, not the equation, but the problem that he was trying to solve. See, I just don't want to run out of paper. In the 1890s. Uh, the king of uh, the Tsar of Russia, he was in St. Petersburg, offered a prize of a lot of money to whomever could solve a problem that had driven physicists crazy for the longest time. Physicists knew how to, if this is the sun and this is the earth, they had already known since Newton how to figure out how the earth moves around the sun. That is, in fact, what made Newton famous, that he discovered that the orbits were elliptical and that uh, they had a particular radius and, and so on and so forth. But physicists were going crazy the moment they added the moon. Because as the Earth is rotating around the sun, the moon is rotating around the Earth, but it's being affected both by the gravitational field of the Earth and by the gravitational field of the Sun, and so the Moon did some crazy movements. And no one had been able to figure out how to model, mathematically, the, the system with the Sun, the Earth, and the Moon. They knew perfectly well how to handle two bodies, that is, the spaces of two dimensions, but they couldn't figure out what, they, what, what, what became famously known as the, as the three-body problem. I didn't have all this data from the, from the stars and from astronomy. Yeah, yeah, they, they had the data and they had the data. The physical the tides and the moon and... Yeah, the exactly. They had, they had the data and they knew that the moon actually followed a complex trajectory once, once you add the, the entire thing. What they, what they had they hadn't managed to do is to create an equation that could capture and mimic the data. Yeah, the data they had, the, the French had solved the moon astronomically in the, eight, in the late 1700s. Lagrange and, and Laplanche were the, the guys who finally mastered the moon. I mean, just, to do that, just so that you see what this means. Imagine that we are on Earth, we're going around the sun. So Mars, that's over here, is also going around the sun, but we are at the same time spinning around our own axis, going around the sun. So when we look at Mars, the trajectory that Mars leaves in the sky is very complex. So it's, 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 it's like when you take a bicycle and put a light in one of the in one of the wheels, and then start going at night with your bicycle, and the light is not only moving around the wheel, but it's moving with the bicycle. And so what you see is a spiral of light. And that's a similar thing that what happens with the planets. We are spinning and we're going around the sun. They are also spinning and going around the sun. So the final result on our sky is similar to that spiral that the light gives with the, with the, with the bicycle. It's 
like a crazy. That's why they were called by the ancients the wandering stars. Because unlike most stars that stay put, the planets look funny from our point of view. Because we are we are we are standing on an observation post that is not only spinning around itself, it's going around the sun, and they themselves are going around the sun, so it's very hard to tell what the planets are doing. When you look at them every day, as astronomers do, and plot their trajectories, they follow a kind of weird, spirally, wavy curve. At any rate, no one had been able to solve this problem. The Tsar of Russia in St. Petersburg gave, offered a price of, I don't know, $15,000, if this might be some like, big chunk of money, to whomever could solve the problem. And Poincaré invented face-to-face to solve the three-body problem. Right? To answer your question. Let's not forget about what exactly is being modeled. Let's just imagine that we have two dimensions that can be temperature and pressure, can be uh, speed and position, can be anything. The important thing is that he began to discover that there were singularities in that space. Certain portions of the space that attracted the trajectories. Now let me give you an example of what this could be. This could be a cell ball. We talked about cell bubbles before because we said that every time a cell film you blow air into it, you create pressure differences, that would be pressure, and there's also an energy in the, in the, in the cell film called surface tension, so that would be the second. And the soap bubble always tends to go to whatever form forms the minimum of surface tension. In which the amount of energy in its, in its, in its shell, so to speak, is, at the, uh, is the least, is the minimum. That means that the minimum is, a, is a, the minimum point of energy. It's almost as if the soap bubble was attracted towards the spherical form by being attracted to the minimum point of energy. So this phase space would represent the, 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 the would represent soap bubbles, for instance. Every soap bubble starts at a different place because you blow sometimes very hard, sometimes very very low. But as they change and they change in their uh, uh, pressure and surface tension, they all end up in the same point. They become attracted to the same topological point, and that's why we always get the same repetitive sphere over and over. Some spheres are small, some spheres are, are large, so bubbles come in different sizes, but it's always the sphere. The same thing can apply to crystals. Crystals also form with exact same shape over and over and over again by minimizing, this time not surface energy, but bonding energy, the energy they're going to use to form bonds. Let's take, for example, a crystal of regular table salt. When you take some salt and sprinkle it and look at it through a microscope, what you see is tiny little cubes. Every single salt of, you know, tiny little cubes that have a chlorine atom in the middle and sodium atoms at the corner. It would look like that. And of course, many other substances make many other shapes of crystals. But, it, but the same phase space can account for the crystal. Because the crystal also gets, a, the molecules of the crystal become attracted to the point of minimum bonding energy. They are going to have to spend energy creating those bonds to create the cube. But they, they manage to spend the least amount of energy doing that. They are very efficient. But that is also the reason why they are very repetitive. They repeat themselves over and over again. It's always cubes, always cubes. So what Juan Carré discovered is a way of going beyond soap bubbles and beyond, beyond crystals to something that was similar in both cases, 